good evening, Crossroads. How are we doing? We are very light on people at the moment, and I'm sure there's going to be a fair few more people coming in. Um, but we are, ex- yeah, if you want to come forward, come to the front, move to the middle if you feel comfortable, do it. Come on, be those people, absolutely. Shot the front row that was already there that just moved closer. <laughs> Legends. Hey, it's awesome to have you all here with us this, mor- uh, this morning, this evening. Um, if you are new here, welcome. We are Crossroads Church, um, and tonight we are going to be hearing from Pastor Ruben. Um, he's going to be bringing us the word. We get to share in uh, musical worship together. We get to share in communion. Um, it's going to be an awesome night, but we also get to connect with one another, and so we like to start off these services just um, connecting with the people that are around us. Um, if this is somewhere that you call home, um, find a new face and go and chat to them and um, yeah, get to know another person, so we're going to do that for the first few minutes to kick off the service. We will try and get everyone on the sides to stand up and move into the middle. Come on, let's do it. The students are on break, so I thought it was going to fill up a little bit more, but I just found out they're on break, so it's not going to. So it's not too scary, trust me. Awesome, there we go. We've got some movement. Nice. Good job. There we go. See, it's not too scary. A wholesome little family. So good. What a good idea, Tom. <laughs> what a legend. All right, now that you're all just stood up and sat back down, we're all going to stand and prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, think of the lead gains you're going to get from this. Hey, I just wanted to um, read to you the start of Psalms 145. Before we enter a time of worship, it says this, I will exalt you, my King, uh, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let every generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. 
I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with joy about your righteousness. And so, Lord God, as we enter this service tonight, uh, we want to sing for joy of who you are, Lord, um, the miracles and the wonder that you bring. Um, the praise that you deserve, Lord, and so we give this service to you, and as we um, begin and kick off with worship, Lord, may our hearts be open to receive from you this evening. Uh, we praise you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for what you're going to do in this place. Amen. Oh, 
have popped in in between that worship set. Um, welcome to Crossroads tonight. Um, my name's Hannah, I'm the youth pastor here, and it is just awesome to see so many of you here. Um, and we are in for an awesome night. We've got um, Pastor Ruben bringing us a message on counting the cost of what it looks like to follow Jesus. So I think it's a um, going to be a really awesome message, and I really um, pray that everyone just comes with open hearts, expectant to hear from, um, from the Lord and what He wants to do in your lives. Um, but there's a few things that we like to kind of do to kick off service. Um, just a massive welcome to everyone. Um, but specifically, if you are new, um, welcome. We hope that this is a place that you can call home. Um, and if you want to know any more information about us or if you want to get connected in, um, we have a number of ways to do that. Um, at the back of the auditorium, there's some green cards you can fill in. 
um, and chuck them in the black box beside it um, and then someone from the team will get in touch with you. Um, there's some new people packs out in, in the foyer area that you would have come passed on your way in, so make sure you grab one of them if you're um, wanting to know more. Or you can come and chat to any of the team, any of the um, people up here, um, or anyone around with some lanyards on, I think they should have some on. Um, they would love to chat to you and just answer any questions that you may have or just get you connected in however that looks. And so just a massive welcome um, if you are new here. Um, and then the other thing that we love to chat about is that if this is a place um, that you call home for the past six months or so, um, we would love to get you connected into serving in this place. There are so many different things that happen, not just on a Sunday um, with serving, with tech teams and with welcoming or hot chocolates or music teams, um, but there's so much even during the week that goes on um, and makes this place run. And so if there is a um, way that you want to serve or get connected again, come and find some of the team, fill out a card. We would love to get in touch with you. Um, and then one other notice that is kind of like a one-off at the moment is um, that we have a bake sale on tonight. Um, there was some stuff left over from um, this morning for um, the fundraising event. Um, and so make sure you grab like a piece of cake. I don't actually know what's out there, a piece of cake, biscuits, I don't know. Um, um, and grab that for your hot chocolate afterwards. Um, but it's an awesome uh, cause to support. Um, and so, yeah, get connected in that way. Um, the other thing I was meant to say is that Josh Gowan got baptised today. How exciting is that? Sorry, I was meant to say that at the start. <laughs> um, but yeah, we had an awesome time down at the river just witnessing him uh, making a public declaration to follow Jesus. Um, so that was really cool. Um, so make sure you say congratulations to him as well. Um, but there is heaps of other things going on in the young adult space specifically. And so we're going to check out the announcement reel and see what's happening. Hey everyone, here's what's coming up in the life of our church. Kingdom Night is our monthly prayer and worship gathering, and we count these nights as being so significant for our church. Our next Kingdom Night is this Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. And as we always say, we'd love as many of you to come along as absolutely possible. So if you have Connect Group, bring them along too. Feel free to bring kids with you. You know, the night usually runs until about 8.30 or 9. The next Young Adults event is now live and ready for those aged 18 to 30 to register. We're heading out for a hike together on Saturday the 20th of April once the students are back in town. Uh, the plan is to trek up to Rangawahia Hut and have a picnic lunch together at the top. And this is just another great opportunity to get your mates involved in a church event. So whoever they might be, invite your friends and get them registered. Uh, we'll all meet here at church at about 8.30 in the morning in the back car park and head off in one big convoy. Uh, and you'll want to block out the whole day, but we should be back by 4 or 5. So if you can, head onto the website or the app and get registered. And also let us know if you're in need of a ride and uh, we'll get you sorted. We're really looking forward to that day together. And a couple of other reminders for the young adults. Our Massey Connect group meets up on campus every Wednesday in the centre at 12. So if you're a student up at Massey, we'd love to have you join us. We spend some time studying the word together. Uh, and then those of us who can usually head to the dining hall for lunch too. So come be a part of things if you've got that time on a, on a Wednesday spare. But also know that the Crossroads Cafe is open throughout the week and available for you to come and study, maybe take a break from study, maybe even to use for your group assignment meetings. Whatever it is, uh, we can get you hooked us into some free Wi-Fi. We'll even shout you a copy to get you through the assignment writing. Uh, so that's open Mondays through to Thursdays from 9 to 4.30. Come and make the most of it. But that's it for Church News this week. If you want to register for anything or get some more details, head along to our website. But for now, enjoy the rest of the service. Very cool. There's some great ways there to, to be together, to be community, and um, yeah, be more than just a gathering on a Sunday. So get amongst some of those things coming up. Now we have the opportunity to um, spend some time in communion. And communion is something that we do regularly. And if you've been visiting here for a while, you might have noticed that, that man, you guys do this thing like on a regular basis. And, and what we're doing when we take part in communion is we are recognizing and reflecting and remembering the fact that Jesus gave his life for us, that he died on the cross for us, that his blood was poured out, that his body was broken for us. And the, the juice represents his blood and, and the bread represents his body. Uh, but the reason we do it so regularly is because of how powerful that moment was, how incredible that moment was. And in, in Hebrews chapter 10, the author uh, sort of explains what exactly was going on there on the cross and, and what that has done for us. 
he's writing uh, to some some Jewish Christians, and he's talking about how they used to do things and how that's going to be different now. And he starts off by saying, this new covenant I will make with my people on that day, says the Lord, is that I will put my law in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. And he, then the Lord says, I will never again remember their sins and lawless deeds. And when sins have been forgiven, there is no need to offer any more sacrifices. And so this is what it means for us. It says, so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus has opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. You know, for a long time for the Jewish people, when they gathered together to worship God, there was only specific individuals that could enter into what was considered the most holy place, the, the place where you were meeting like one-on-one -on -one with God, essentially. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying there is now that Jesus has given his life on the cross and, and forgiven us, we now enter into that space freely. And so as we gather here tonight and we worship together and we sing praises to him and we hear from his word and his spirit is with us and guides us, that's all possible because of what Jesus did on the cross. And for the Jewish people, for thousands and thousands of years, they would have longed for the moment that we have here tonight, that we can gather together and all be filled with the Spirit and guided by Him. And so the reason we do what we do so regularly with communion is because of how powerful that is. Because everything we do on a Sunday and throughout the week and all that stuff, it all hinges on the fact that Jesus gave His life for us and that we can only have a relationship with Him because of that. So now in your own time, if you consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, if that's something that you're not sure about yet, feel free to, to stay sitting. Yeah, don't uh, feel like you have to do something that you, you're uncomfortable with. But for those of us who are followers of Jesus, when in your own time, come down and, and take the juice, take the bread, and, and return to your seed, and, and just reflect on what Jesus did and how that changes everything. It changes everything. The fact that we are here tonight, gathered together to worship, is all because of that moment. So let me just pray for us, and then let's do that. Jesus, we are so grateful for your sacrifice. Let us not forget how powerful that is. Let us not take for granted what we have here, the fact that when we pray, the fact that when we worship, the fact that when we go about our life, your spirit is with us. And that is something that followers of you wanted for so, so long. And we live in that moment. We have the power, the ability to step into your presence. And man, we're so grateful for that. And we recognize that it's only because of you, Jesus. It's only because of you that that's even possible. So now we give this moment to you to reflect on that, to remember that your body was broken for us and your blood was poured out and that it was so much more than a physical thing, Lord. You were doing a spiritual thing to be able to make us new, to be able to cover our debt and forgive us. And we're grateful for that. So this time is yours, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. So in your own time, come take the bread and the juice.
some praise. Let's praise our Lord and our King and our Savior who is so worthy of our praise. Jesus, we thank you. We praise and worship the wonderful name of Jesus and say you are faithful, you are good, you are almighty, and we are so grateful that you went to the cross of Calvary, you shed your blood so that we can be free from sin and death. So Jesus, from the bottom of our hearts, we praise you and thank you for what you've done and give all glory and all honor. In Jesus' name we pray and we all say together, amen, amen. How good. Let's give a hand to the team for leading us tonight. Man, that, uh, that worship was anointed. That was, that was a special time in the presence of, of God. Um, I've got a public uh, confession to make. So this morning we um, had a service and I was service leading. I didn't, I didn't quite hear what Jake said the age bracket was for young adults. And, and I made this bold claim that in order to call yourself a young adult, you have to be 18 to 25. Now Jake just said 18 to 30, am I right? So there's a friend of mine who's 27 who I deeply offended. So I apologize. You are, in fact, a young adult. 
which is good to know. But it doesn't change anything for me, unfortunately. Um, and I'm still outside that category of, of a young adult. The other little thing that I love that you guys could do after the service that would be a massive help. See these wee boys? Could you chuck them in the bin when you're done? The communion cups? Thank you. There's bins at the back of the auditorium. Please put those in the bins. That would be amazing. Because what we do in the, in the week is come in and stand on them. And then we have to clean up more mess. Um, because we forget they're there. And then um, it's just a disaster. Um, what, a, what a special weekend we had last weekend. Celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and our Savior Jesus. It was a special time together. And um, we're leading into uh, a two-week series that we have here at Night Church. Uh, this week, I'm speaking to you guys on you get what you pay for, looking at the cost of following Jesus. Uh, and then next Sunday night, Pastor Jake, is, he's going to speak to us about idols. Um, so I'm really looking forward to these next two weeks. And um, I genuinely feel tonight, as I prepared for this evening, that, that God has been speaking directly into my heart for someone here tonight. Um, I'm not quite sure where this is going to end. Um, and I haven't actually prepared an ending, so we'll see where this goes, but I really feel God has got a word for someone um, in the auditorium or online tonight. So with that in mind, are you ready for a journey? Good, good. I hope you are. I want to talk about following Jesus, and, and for some of us, that's been a journey for a long time. For some of us, it's been a very short time, or for some of us who are here tonight or watching online, this, you, you might never have followed Jesus yet, but I believe there's something for all of us in, in this message. Uh, if you've got a Bible, um, we're going to look at some scripture together. Uh, and we're going to jump to the book of Matthew uh, at a well-known chapter when Jesus is about to call the future disciples Simon Peter uh, and Andrew. And we're going to be reading from chapter 4 of Matthew, uh, verse 18. Uh, and you can read it on your, your iPhone, your iPad, or your eyeballs. Um, that was so funny, isn't it? Um, so let's, let's crack into 18, because if anybody's got an Android, it probably won't load it up fast enough. Um, verse 18, as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting their nets into the lake, and they were fishermen. Come, follow me. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once, they left their nets and they followed him. Now, in the book of Hebrews, it says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that means if he's called the disciples back then by saying, follow me, then he calls us the same, to follow him. Amen? Good. You know, for us who are followers of Jesus, we've maybe heard messages like this many times where that call is put out to your life. Do you want to step into what God has to you? Do you really want to follow Jesus? And I guess if all of us over in this church um, who is committed to that one time or another uh, have prayed that prayer that, God, I want to do exactly what it is you have for me. I, I want to follow you. I want to give everything to you. And we've sung songs like, I have decided to f Amen. I, 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 and we have these response to these sorts of messages, these call to actions, and we're excited about it, and we're passionate, and then Monday comes, and it's all gone. Who's been there before? Let's be honest. I have been there. I've been there. However, it's a very important question, and I don't know if I've ever heard this question asked in church before. Where's Jesus going? He's asked us to follow him. Where's he going? Where, where's he going? Uh, what is the cost to follow Jesus? What direction, what destination is Jesus going to? And I, I guess if you're really serious about following someone for the rest of your life, <laughs> it should be of interest of you to know where that person's going, right? Because if you mean business with the commitment that you've made, you're going to end up where the person is leading you is ending up. You see, that person's destination becomes your destination. Uh, the same thing is, uh, happened whenever I, I, I met Sarah, uh, my wife, and, and I saw her for the very first time. Woo! It was in my early 20s, and, um, which when I was a young adult, I know. And I, I remember seeing her for the first time, and 
you know that you hear those like romantic stories that people fall in love at, at first sight. It, is, it does happen because I fell head over heels for Sarah on the first go. We had a mutual friend. I'll give you a bit of the story. Someone, people like these stories, right? We had mutual friends. We lived a couple of streets apart um, uh, at university. I was studying in Bible college. She was studying um, in Queen's University in Belfast. And uh, we had mutual friends. Um, and uh, I had never met her before. I had been told about this wonderful uh, girl, Sarah. And um, Ruben, you should, you should meet Sarah. I was like, oh, should I? That would be good. And anyway, we, I rock into the house uh, to see Sarah. Oh, no, sorry, to, to the mutual friend's house. Uh, and I, I prance on in like the, the, the cocky young boy I was, uh, full of confidence, thinking I ran the house because, you know, that's what you do in student accommodation. The next house that has more food than you becomes your house. Um, and that's what I treated it, these friends like. So I, I marched on into the house. I saw a fruit bowl, and I picked up an apple, and I started munching away on it. And I thought it was just our mutual friend's apple. Turns out it was Sarah's apple. Okay, so first impressions is that I stole her apple. So that wasn't a great start, if I'm honest. Um, but I must have ate the apple in a very attractive way because she was interested, which is good. And, and what I decided to do to be a real good gentleman, I went back out to the shop and I bought a full new bag of apples on my student allowance. Come on. And, and from that moment onwards, we had this incredible time where we bonded over music and da-da-da-da-da. Um, but I did not propose to her that night, okay? I didn't propose to her that night. It was pretty close. It was the day after. But that night, I, I didn't propose to her because I didn't know her, right? It would be a bit weird if I did the first night. That only happens in the movies, but falling in love happens pretty quick on. Because the reason why we didn't propose straight away was I didn't know her destination. Are you with me? I didn't know where she was going. <laughs> and we needed time to get to know one another so we could both realize like, where we're heading in life, what direction we want to head in. And is that in the same direction or is that opposites? Because if it's opposites, it's not going to work. Are you with me? So here we are, we have this conversation about direction in life and where we want to go, and sure enough, God brings everything just together, and we make this commitment when we realize that the destination that we're heading in is the same direction. You see, the big question for you and me is, Jesus is saying, follow me, follow me. And we need to answer that question by saying, well, where's he going? Where's he going to end up if we're really serious about follow, following Jesus? Because let me tell you, if you are serious about your commitment to following Jesus, there is a cost to following Jesus, but you, want, you need to be on the same direction as Jesus. Are you with me? We need to be heading towards the same destination. Now, luckily for us, there's one chapter in the Bible that gives us the answer to this question, and it's in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the book of, of Luke in the New Testament. So again, if you've got your Bibles, jump to chapter 15. Um. Could you guys do me a favor at the back and bring up some house lights? I'm not seeing their faces, and I want to see their reactions when I say funny things. Um, oh, yeah, that's good. Bring it a wee bit more. That would be lovely. So Luke chapter 15. And, and in Luke chapter 15, we have basically, it contains three parables. We have the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son, or otherwise known as the prodigal son. Now, what I need you to understand, I just want to teach you a wee bit on this. As Jesus is teaching, uh, and we can read this right throughout the Gospels, that he normally shares about one uh, parable that emphasizes and educates us on a spiritual truth, okay? He uses a parable to share a, a story that usually has a connection to, uh, I don't want to know why I'm saying usually, it always has a connection to a spiritual truth. There's a few rare occasions, uh, primarily in the Gospel of Matthew, where he continues to, uh, and he actually uses two parables to communicate the exact same truth, okay? But those are rare. Those are rare. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, and this is the study that I've done, I've only found it once that he uses three parables to, uh, to share the exact same spiritual truth, okay? And all of the four Gospels. It's almost like he's so anxious that we will get it. <laughs> and I love that. He gives one parable and he says, I hope you understand that. If you don't get it, I'll give you another, another one. And if you're really stupid, I'll give you a third one. But I'm still communicating, understand this, I'm still communicating the exact same spiritual truth each and every time. And what it communicates is the answer to what's going on. So let's read the first two parables together, and then I'm going to sum up the third one because it's quite long, and I want to save some time. Luke chapter 15. 
Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be one uh, more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then it follows up with the parable of the, the prodigal son or the lost son. And basically, the, this, this father has two sons. One of the sons wants his inheritance early, so he went up and, and he spent it up in sinful ways, and he came to his senses, and he realized that what he'd done was all wrong, and he decided to go back to the father's house, hoping that the father would receive him at least as a servant or a slave. When he's still far away, the father sees him and runs to him and hugs him and fully restores him to the point where his brother, who's been at home the whole time, gets jealous of the attention and the love that the lost son was shown by his father. So that's the three parables, okay? And let me tell you the spiritual truth that we see this. Let's go on a bit of a, a, bit of a journey with this. So let's an analyze these three parables real quick. You see, in every one of these three parables, there are some things that are in common. There's something that is in the wrong place. There's something that is in the right place. And then there's God, something representing God. Now, the first parable about the lost sheep, in the parable we have the God represented as the shepherd. This is a good idea. Why don't you answer for me? That would be great. Uh, and there's, there's something that's in the wrong place. What's the suggestion? Well, it's on. You get it. Uh, and, 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 and then the, on the right place, we have the 99. Okay. There's 99 uh, sheep in the right place, and they're there with the shepherd. They're, wh they're where they're supposed to be. In the second parable, God is represented by the God is represented by the, yeah, the one thing that's in the right, uh, the, the wrong place is the one thing in the right place. Yeah, good, good. And, and, and in the prodigal son, God is represented by the father. The wrong place is one of the sons, and the other right place is one of the sons. Look, what we need to focus on here and what we need to see, Jesus is trying to make these three parables, one after the other, for us to understand. The number one story of the, in, in the lost sheep, there's the shepherd. The shepherd is represented by God. You see, his full focus, his full focus is on that of the one sheep. Even if that sheep is a minority, that shepherd leaves the 99 in the wilderness. And this seems like a crazy thing to do. And I'm so happy that that shepherd wasn't an Irish shepherd because of an Irish shepherd, he would be like, oh, well, I've still got 99. Could be worse. But you see, there's there's something in the heart of the shepherd that cannot stand the thought of even one sheep that's in his possession, that is loved by him, that would be off in the wilderness. So he leaves the 99, and that 99, in one sense, represents you and I. He leaves the 99 in the desert, and he says, well, you're okay, you're safe, but I'm going to seek that which is lost. Are you with me? Second parable, attention is of the woman is, is fully in the wrong place again, and that's going to the one coin that is lost. She sweeps the house, she searches carefully, she lights her lamp, she's fully focused on finding and saving and rescuing and getting back that lost coin. Then and finally, the focus of the father is on the lost son. How do we know that? Because when he returned, the Bible says that he was still far away. Even though the son was far away, he was returning back. The father saw him in the distance. And if you imagine with me, it's almost as if the father had been there on a daily basis just looking out and hope and praying that the son would return. And when he sees his son on the horizon, he runs to him and puts his arms around him and greets him and welcomes him back. So I believe that, that Jesus is trying to make a point here, and he's trying to get our attention to focus on that which is lost. That which is lost. He's going to find the lost sheep. He's going to find the lost son or the lost coin. Those that are in the wrong place, that's where his focus is. Are you with me? 
And the thing is, though, when he's focusing on those who are in the wrong place, he looks around at those who have been saved, the 99 sheep, the nine coins, and the other son at home. He turns around, he makes eye contact with them, and what does he say? He says, follow me. Follow me. Do as I do. Follow me. Do as I do. Go after that which is lost. That's the destination that God wants us to go on. That's the direction that He wants us to go. And I truly believe that this is, this is, the, this is the version of Christianity that Jesus has for us. This is the, the version of Christianity that God wants for us. To be focused on that which is lost, not just on ourselves and what's going on around in our world and, and making sure we're okay. If we have Jesus, we have everything. But our attention should be on that which is lost. So if I asked you the question, if that's the focus, if that's the direction that God wants to take you in, are you all in for Jesus and that's the direction that you're happy going in? You say you're all in for Jesus, are you happy to have your focus and your attention on that which is lost? Because I truly believe this is what Jesus is teaching us here. I want to tell you a story about uh, two young guys. Um, their name is Marcus and Daniel. Don't, they won't mean anything to you, but this story is true. And I heard this story, and it just blew my mind, and I loved it. And I wanted to share it with you. Marcus was 17 at the time, and he heard this message about what's the cost of following Jesus and, uh, and what it would take to step out in faith and be in the same direction that Jesus wants us to go in. And, and for him, the idea of sharing the gospel was just like, oh, that's too much for me too much for me. He was, he was quite shy. He was an introvert, if you like. And the thought of being an extrovert and actually taking an initiative to share the gospel um, of Jesus, it just didn't come naturally to, to Marcus. But he made his mind up. He was in one of these services, and he had this like, moment of going all in, this commitment that I, I'm going to follow Jesus, and I'm going to go in the same direction as Jesus, and I'm going to find that lost sheep. I'm going to find that lost coin. I'm going to find that lost son or daughter. So the decision that he made was the next morning that he's going to go to school, he's, um, he's going to open the door, really brave, and he's going to walk up to the first person he sees, and he's going to invite them to his, his life group. So uh, that next morning, went to school, opens up the door, first person he sees is Daniel, this guy Daniel. The two of them had never spoken before. He doesn't even know who he is, they'd never met. But Marcus had made a commitment to Jesus, and he walked straight up to Daniel and this was such an on Marcus thing to do. And he invited him to the life group meeting. And Daniel accepted. And you sort of think to yourself, well, that was quite easy, wasn't it? <laughs> but there's one little detail that Marcus left out. He didn't tell Daniel <laughs> that it was a Christian life group. So Daniel thought he was invited to a party. He was so confused, he prepared himself for a party. He got himself a nice fit, some six shoes. He thought he was going dancing put on some aftershave to impress the ladies at this party. So he shows up to this given address. He rings the doorbell, and a mother opens the door. And Daniel's mind just went, boo, 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 what is going on here? This is not the party. Why is there a mom opening the door? He was led into the living room. He walks into the living room, and there's eight to ten people sitting around a table. At this point, Daniel is freaking out. One of them had a guitar. What is this? What sort of party is this? <laughs> so he sat down, you know, and they started to sing a few songs, Kumbaya and stuff like that, and, and they chatted, and, and then somebody said, let's pray. So Daniel's like in full sweat mode, like he is panicking, he is like, what on earth am I doing here? He had, he had never been to church before. He had no, never heard the gospel before, no idea, Jesus, uh, no idea about Christianity, no prior Christian experience at all all. Can you imagine what it would have been like for him in that moment? So they're just sitting there, and what's happened is that the one person prayed, and the next person prayed, and Daniel's freaking out because he's looking that it's coming around in the circle, and it's going to be his turn soon. And Daniel's like, well, there's not a chance that I'm going to pray. And when it comes to his turn, words start coming out of his mouth, and he had no idea what he was about to say. This is a true testimony, so don't think this is a, a far-fetched story. This is a true testimony. And the words that he uttered out of his mouth was, could you please pray for my grandfather who's got cancer? He's only got a few months to live. 
He couldn't believe that he just said this out loud. And of course, the life group, yep, 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 of course, we'll pray, we'll pray. They jumped on the occasion to pray for him. And you know what? After a while, the, uh, the evening came to an end, and, and Daniel walked out the door, and he just thought to himself, that was the weirdest party I've ever been at in my life. However, one week later, Daniel's mother calls him at school overjoyed, saying, Daniel, Daniel, they've taken x-rays of your grandfather, and the cancer that was going to kill him is completely gone. Completely gone. This is a true story, people. Isn't that amazing? And Daniel said, well, well, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, before we get excited, when did they take the x-rays? And his mother said it was the day after you went to that life group. And Daniel calls Marcus, and he says, we need to talk now. We need to have a conversation right now, right now. Marcus brought Daniel to church for the very first time he had ever been in church, the very first time he'd ever heard the gospel, and it was the first time he responded to Jesus at the altar call. He lifts his hand, and he accepts Jesus into his heart. A few years, later, a few years has passed since, since that time for them. Daniel attended uh, one year of Bible college, and then he uh, attended one year of mission school. And now Daniel, who knew nothing of Jesus, who answered uh, an invitation to what he thought was a party, is now a full-time missionary in the red light district in Thailand. Isn't it amazing what God can do with people's lives? And Marcus, the guy who was brave and uh, very scared and introverted, he's now a full-time missionary in China. Isn't that incredible what God can do in people's lives? You see, you have no idea. The reason why I share that story is when we step into the fullness that God has for us, we have no idea the things that will start to move. And, and w- when we step into our true calling for God and we're in the same destination, in the same direction, and we're seeking that which is lost. But here's the thing. You know, w- w- I talked to you that we want to talk about, this is the idea of following Jesus. Uh, the question and the, th- the comment that I need to make briefly about this is about your commitment to that. Your commitment to that. And, and this is the point where we all feel on edgy because uh, uh, there's, there's things that I'm going to say that's going to resonate with some of you and you're going to think, man, is he speaking to me personally? Yes, I am. It's God's Spirit speaking to you because I believe this is for us this evening. And, and what it looks like on your end of the bargain, and because if I'm honest, your generation, I'm speaking primarily to the young adults here, I believe that you've been over-promised and un- under-delivered in some ways. And I kind of think it's the generation before you's fault. Not to point fingers, I'm not trying to blame anyone, but this is how I personally believe it. Because there's this idea that goes around with young adults at the moment, is that you get something without giving anything. I don't know, does that sit well or not well with you guys? It's easy just to get something and I don't have to do too much work. I feel like that's, I feel like that's the occasion. You know what I mean? It feels like we have member level status benefits but yet we're only guests. Are you with me? L- let me talk about a few personal things that I've seen. In relationships, the ladies will understand, there's some guys in the room maybe, who feel like they've got member level status. But I'm sorry boys, you've only got guest. You've only got guest level. I'm serious. I'm serious. When it comes to, it comes to relationships, where we're like, well, I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever I please. No, you can't. No, you can't. It's careers. Let's think about careers. Uh, uh, and sometimes when I look around and see things now the, 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 in this generation, it's like someone saying, well, if you don't like it, you just close your laptop. <laughs> and that's what happened since COVID, these remote working days that, you know, if something gets on our nerves and we're not quite sure of it, what do we do? We just close our laptop. We're done. Oh, the Wi-Fi went out. No, it didn't. We've seen it. We've seen it in friendships. I see it in friendships all the time where you said something about me and I didn't like it. I'm never going to speak to you again. Come on, people. You said something about their style. They don't like their hat. And then all of a sudden, you're not friends anymore. See, it almost feels like our commitment to one another is really fragile, isn't it? It's really fragile. And we see it in faith all the time. When the going gets tough, when there's something that's going to cost me, I'm out. I'm done. Can't do it anymore. I'm committed and until it's too much to ask. But I truly, I truly believe you do get what you pay for. What you put into it, you'll get out of it. Who's ever traveled on international airlines that are cheap? 
I have, right? And I am just privileged to be on an airline, to be honest, because airlines are expensive, right? And I decided, Sarah and I decided one time that we would go home back to the UK the, the cheapest and quickest way possible. Man, it was one of the biggest regrets. You'd walk up to the door, you'd be carrying a backpack, and they're like, oh, sir, are you bringing that backpack with you? And they'd be like, yeah, <laughs> like hand luggage. And he goes, oh, no, that's $60. Uh, um, do you want a seatbelt? That's five bucks if you want a seatbelt. Um, you, you want a glass of water? $20. <laughs> $20. You want to use the toilet? Premium, 25 for the toilet. And it somewhat feels like, well, if I had paid a bit more, I would have got something a bit nicer. But you get what you pay for. Do you see what I mean? And I tell you that story is because we sometimes feel like that in our relationship with Jesus. We just, oh, well, I'll attend church on a Sunday, but see, when it comes to Monday, I'm going to go back to doing everything that I want to do. Are you with me? You see, see, the thing is, when we're called to pick up our cross, it doesn't say pick up our cross on Sunday, drop it off at McDonald's on Sunday night, and then, and then carry on your week as normal. No, it doesn't say that. It says pick up your cross and do what? Daily sacrifice yourself to Jesus. Each and every day. Our relationship with Jesus can't be some sort of fragile commitment. Whenever it suits me, I'll, I'll be all in. Whenever it suits me, I'll be committed. And I feel like that's sort of the generational language that I hear so much these days. That my security, my well-being is the most important thing. You see, what I love about Jesus is this. Jesus does the opposite. What I love about our Savior is He tells you exactly what it's going to cost you to follow Him. Isn't Jesus good? Come on, church. Isn't Jesus good? You know, he could go on to tell us the benefits of following him and, and all the experiences you're going to have with him here on earth and tell you that he's going to cover you, he's going to be faithful to you, and he's going to be loving to you, he's going to be sovereign over you and over your story, and there's more room in the Bi uh, not enough room in the Bible to explain how good he's going to be to you, and one day we'll stand face to face, there'll be no more pain, no more hurting, no more sin. But he does take time to tell us that there's a cost of following Jesus. And what I want you to do is daily sacrifice yourself every day to me and accept me as your Lord and Savior and head in this direction where we're going to seek and save that which is lost. But there will be a cost. There's going to be something you're going to have to give up. There's going to be that one thing or there's multiple things that you're going to have to lay down for the sake of Jesus. And I guess the challenge is, are we actually willing to be all in, or are we putting it all in with a sort of like, oh, but maybe just not that. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to that, but I still want all of you, Jesus. And it's almost like we want oil and water to work, but it doesn't work like that. We have to get rid of the sin. We've got to get rid of the thing that's holding us back in order for us to go all in for Jesus. You see, what happens when we have those things that we hold on to and don't release to Him? There becomes distance between us and God. I don't know if you've ever experienced this in, 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 your, in your journey and your walk with God, that when you're feeling like God's very distant, it doesn't take long till we look in our lives and we see that, oh, I can see why He feels distant, because there's something in my life that I haven't dealt with. Because the reality is God goes nowhere. God goes nowhere. He's always there. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Let's go back to the story that I shared at the very start where Paul, or Peter, sorry, and Andrew are called to Jesus to follow me. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 58, it talks, it talks about Peter. And Peter, Peter went on to do amazing things for God. He was incredible. He did really well. But later on in his life, when it came to the time that Jesus was about to be crucified, when he was about to head to Calvary, something happened with Peter. Something happened. Verse 58, but Peter followed from a distance. Peter followed from a distance. Right up to the courtyard of the high priest, he entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. You see, at this point for Peter, the stakes were so much higher. The stakes were as high as they possibly could be. The cost of following Jesus was ultimately, if he had been associated with Jesus, would have been his own life. Would have been his own life. He was at risk of losing his safety and his security and his, his, his comfort. And all of a sudden, Peter makes the mistake of, of, of allowing distance between him and God. And, and I know you're probably thinking, well, I think Peter was probably doing that just so he could be safe. But here's the thing. I'm not so sure, because when I read this scripture over and over, uh, he's still following Jesus, of course, but it seems like he's created a distance. And later on in the chapter, we see that when pressure is applied to Peter, what happens? They ask him, hey, don't you know who Jesus is? 
And all of a sudden, he starts to say, no, no, I don't know him. I don't know that man. And what we see is that he's allowed distance in his relationship with, with Jesus, and all of a sudden, his relationship begins to change. And that happens for us. When we allow things to get in between us and God, our distance starts to become more and more, and then all of a sudden, we, we, we feel like there's, a, there's, there's this change, and our focus begins to come off God, and we start to focus on our security, our safety, and not finding the lost sheep, and not finding the lost coin or the son or the daughter. You see, if these people had asked P- Peter uh, uh, earlier in his story that when he was walking with God or walking with Jesus, he would have responded, yes, I'm a follower of Jesus. I love him so much. Would you like to pray the prayer after me to become a follower of him? But now all of a sudden there's distance, and that affects how he sees and looks at other people. All of a sudden his whole goal of his own comfort, his own security, holding on for his life, anything that might save his own life becomes his priority. But praise God, when Jesus resurrected on Easter Sunday, Peter does return back to him and give his life fully to him. But I think as I look at this story and I look at these examples from the, 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 um, the Peter and, and these parables, as we focus on that which is lost, that's the direction Jesus is going on. And I guess the question that I have for us, and, or sorry, the sort of the idea that I have for us is that if we are fully committed to following Jesus, well, that means that our attention is on the destination where He's calling us to, which is to seek that which is lost. And if you're, you've got any other ideas that it's not that, I think you're misunderstanding what it is to follow Jesus, because the cost of following Jesus is to live daily in a sacrifice for Him so that we can pursue uh, sharing the good news with people who are lost. That's the call we have on our lives. That's the call we have on our lives. And we've got to step into that. We've got to be bold with that. I just want to finish with a story about the Titanic. And I promise you it does relate to the rest of what I've just been talking about. And I, I'm sure you know the, the basic story. There was a huge ship. Uh, it was the largest man-made object in the world at the time. It was going from Southampton to a maiden journey across to the Atlantic over to the U.S. with passengers up to two, uh, 2,201 people on board. Uh, and in the middle of the night, the ship hits an iceberg and, and it starts to sink. Now, it, there's, there's, there's quite a long time that passes between hitting the iceberg and, and fully um, the, the, the ship fully going down. It was about three and a half hours um, after impact um, until it disappeared. So you think that's quite a lot of time for lifeboats to come in and out of the ocean to help bring people home. But the strange thing is that when you study the story of the Titanic, uh, the disaster, when the lifeboats were lowered into the ocean throughout that first hour of impact, only the, the lifeboats were only half full, half full at best. The Titanic lifeboats had the capacity to save up to 70 people. This is well documented. And it's clearly d- documented how many people were on each one. And they reckon in the first hour of saving people in the t- Titanic, there was between 30 to 12 people on each lifeboat. So what that meant that when the ship finally went down, all over the ocean, they had all these lifeboats, and they're only half full with capacity to save more people. And all of a sudden, there's hundreds of people in the water fighting for their lives and screaming, help. Is anybody else thinking about Jack and Rose right now? And this is what they called the second disaster of the Titanic. The fact that even though there were so many lifeboats and so many seats to spare, everyone started to roll away from the scene of the disaster. They managed to shut out the fact that all these people were in the water struggling for their lives. And they actually could have helped them. But they were happy to get away because they knew that they were safe. They knew that they were safe. They were rolling away one single boat. Only one single boat came back. Just one. And when I read this story, I really felt like God was speaking right to my heart. That this is almost like this picture of the end times. Okay? This is the first version right here that we've just read. Where we're just happy with the fact that we made it. We're just happy with the fact that we made it. We know Jesus. We're on our ways to heaven. 
And even though there's so many more seats on the lifeboat, I'm just happy that I made it. When I looked at that, I was so heavy hearted. You know, I was praying, I was repenting for my own sake and praying that I would not end up there, that I would not end up with this attitude. Then I start thinking, like, Lord, we need to seek that which is lost. There's more room on the lifeboats. There's more room in the lifeboats. And I thought, Lord, surely in this story, there has to be another version. There has to be something good that comes from this. And then I found another version. Praise God, because this would have been a boring end to the sermon. There was one man on board that ship, and his name was John Harper. John Harper was a 39-year-old Scottish evangelist, and he was on board the Titanic, and he, Titanic, and he, was, he was heading to Chicago. Um, he was going to preach the gospel to thousands of people. And with him on the trip, he had the apple of his eye, his little daughter, Annie Jesse, who was six years old. Annie Jesse and John Harper were among the very first people to realize that the ship was going down. They were one of the first ones in their cabins who were sh- uh, to be, be alerted that, 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 that they, the ship was going down. How do we know that? Well, when one of the first lifeboat uh, records came back that was lowered into the ocean, there on the list was Annie Jesse Harper who was registered as one of the passengers, but not John Harper. He wasn't on the lifeboat. The other passengers of the lifeboat all witnessed later on how John Harper came up with his daughter in his arms, holding her as tight as possible. And he held her for a few seconds. He kisses her on the forehead and looks at her and he said, I'll see you sometime later. I love you so much. And he puts his daughter into the lifeboat and He wants to make sure that she's well taken care of and the lifeboat is lowered. Now this is the time. This is the moment for John Harper to show that he's fully committed to following Jesus. This was his opportunity to start looking for the lost sheep, the lost coin, or the lost son or daughter. And he starts running like a madman around the Titanic, smacking on the cabin doors, crying out, women, children, and people who don't know Jesus, get to the lifeboats now. Women and children and people who don't know Jesus get to the lifeboats now because in his perspective that as he died tonight, he knew where he was going. He knew his destination. I might be getting there a little bit sooner, he thought. But if someone dies here tonight who doesn't know Jesus, well, then you're going to have an eternity that is completely separated from God. So my goal and my ambition for the time that I've left here is to let everyone who isn't a follower of Jesus to get on the lifeboats. What a testimony of this guy. He said, that was my calling right now as a follower of Jesus. Finding the lost sheep, finding the lost coin, finding the lost son and daughter. And all around him, lifeboats were lowered. He, he, had, he, had got, he could have gotten into any of those lifeboats. There was plenty of space. And would we have blamed him? Probably not. Because that meant he could have been with his daughter. But he didn't. He didn't. John Harper ended up being one of the hundreds in the water that night. After realizing that he was in the water, the lifeboats were rolling away. He realized there was no more chance of survival. So he changed his battle cry. He changed his battle cry from this, calling out to the top of his voice. He would scream across the ocean, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And there's countless testimonies. The reason why we know this is true, there's countless testimonies that have been recorded that they could hear the cry and the anguish of a male voice shouting at the top of his voice, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And you know, the truth is God only knows how many people give their life to Jesus in those last few minutes. About a year later after the disaster, there was a reunion for the Titanic for those who survived. And the first person who came up and gave his testimony was a young man called William John Mellors. He was only 19 years old when he boarded the ship, one of the many hundreds who ended up in the water that night. And he said, I still remember this. He said, I remember holding on to a piece of debris, trying to make it, but realizing that I'm going to die tonight before my life has even begun. Then the current brought him close to a man called John Harper. (laughs) And this man looked at the 19-year-old. John Harper looked at the 19-year-old and shouted to him, Do you know Jesus? And William was not really prepared to answer the question. 
He didn't know what to say. And John Harper called to him, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. And then the currents pulled them apart again. So William's trying to process what he's, what he's just heard. A few minutes later, the currents bring the two men back together again. And John Harper calls out, Do you know Jesus now? And William responded, No, sir, I cannot honestly say that I do. And again, John Harper called out, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that was the last time anyone saw John Harper. William John Mellers gave his life to Jesus there in the water in the minutes that he had left. And then that one returning lifeboat came back and picked him up. And picked him up. A year later, he's standing in front of all the survivors. He shared his testimony and he ended, ended it by saying, I was saved twice that night. And I truly believe that this from the story of the Titanic and how things finished up, that we've got two versions of what like, end times will look like. One where the, the, the lifeboats are half full and they're just rolled away and we're content that we're saved and we actually haven't invited anybody else into the lifeboat. We weren't actually on the same direction as Jesus. We knew we where we were going, but we didn't take the time to share with others where we were going. See, it's, 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 it's a big question and it's a big struggle for us to fully understand the cost of following Jesus because we like to consider things like our comfort and our safety higher than risking our, 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 all that for the lost sheep or for the lost coin or the lost son. But we know there's a cost to following Jesus and it's going to be tough. But can I dare to dream that in this room there's so much potential and you've probably heard that so many times over your lives already that people look at you and say you've got so much potential. It doesn't matter how old you are. To the oldest, to the youngest person in this room, can I dare to dream that we would be John Harpers of our generation? We could be the John Harpers of our generation that realizing that now is the time to follow Jesus and head in the same direction as Jesus, that we're passionate to seek that which is lost. Meaning that we're giving all, we're giving our best. As I say, there, there is a cost to following Jesus. And um, as, we were, as we were sitting just before and, and the guys were leading us in worship, I really felt like God was speaking to me in His Spirit. And I've been praying since that moment that this is of God and not of myself. And I believe that He's given me some... Uh, some words to speak over us tonight because I believe there's some people in this room who are maybe struggling with something that they need to let go of. I truly believe this and um, you know if I'm wrong and it doesn't match up, then that's okay. That's okay. But I would, I would kick myself for not saying this so I'm going to share what I feel God has, has given to me. I believe there's someone in the room or maybe someone watching online that language is an issue for you. Bad language. And the reason why I say that is that I feel that God is saying that when you're at work and you're out with your mates, they actually don't know that you're a follower of Jesus. They don't know that you're a follower of Jesus. And what I would say to you is that I would encourage you to, to not use bad language, whoever that is. I would encourage you not to use bad language, and I would encourage you to let them know that you're a follower of Jesus. It's my encouragement to you. Uh, I believe I also got a word from God saying that, that someone here um, is struggling with alcohol. Someone here is struggling with alcohol and that they're taking, they're taking too much. You're going over the limit. And I'm not talking about the driving limit. <laughs> I'm talking about when we know too much is too much and we go over that limit. I feel like God is saying, I want you in your spirit and I want to know you and I want your head to be clear and I would encourage you to, to stop. To stop. I feel like God said to me tonight that there's someone in here who is going too far with the partner, that sex is an issue between you and your girlfriend or boyfriend. And God is saying, I've designed that for marriage and that's not to be done outside of marriage. I felt like God said to me that there was someone who's spending too much time on adult websites looking at pornography. And... Um, I felt like God was saying that that's not going to be refreshing for your mind, that that's not going to keep you clear, that you should, you should stop that. I felt God said that someone in here was struggling with jealousy, that they wanted something that you don't have and that really was getting in the way in your relationship with Jesus. I felt like God was saying that there's someone in here who's struggling with selfishness, 
they aren't willing to let go of something because it's for your benefit, not for, for others. And I think more specifically, that was greed for financial gain. I also felt like God was saying, and this is the last one, that God was saying that there's someone in here who's struggling with unforgiveness in their relationship. That you need to forgive, not so that you forget what happened, but more that you can be free. That you can be free. You can be free. Um, I just want to pray specifically over those things right now. Father, um, Lord, I pray that they are from you, that I am not trying to just make this stuff up, Lord. I pray that your spirit is at work in this room. And for any of those people that have maybe uh, identified something in what we've just shared, Lord, I pray that, that through that, Lord, we have this moment. The reason why those words were shared was for us to draw a line in the sand and say, Lord Jesus, I am all in for you, and I am passionate about the direction that you want me to go. But Lord, help me, give me the strength to release myself from those things. Lord, I pray for spiritual breakthrough. I pray for freedom here this evening. So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would move. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe in your life like mine, many times where you've circled around and you ended up coming back to focusing more on your own needs and your own comforts. But I truly feel, I truly feel, I really believe that this message was specific to someone in this room, that we are going to see the next gener uh, John Harpers of our generation. If we are serious about our relationship with Jesus, then that is a cost that we have to give up daily to follow him. And the invitation is for each and every one of us in this room. If you're serious that you want to go all in for Jesus, then there's a cost to following him. But it'll be the best decision you'll ever make. Is it going to be easy? No. <laughs> it's not. Is it going to be worth it? Yes. Why? Because we're passionate for that which is lost. There's more room in the lifeboat. So as the team come and join us for worship, I would love just to spend some time just praying over you. And, and I guess this could be a moment just like Daniel did where he, he stepped out in that story. He stepped out in that story and he, he held his hand up and said, I'm going all in for you, Jesus. Well, I want to leave an invitation for us. If you want to receive that, if you want to be prayed over, then I would love for you to come down the front during the worship uh, uh, time of worship. In fact, just before we go into worship, why don't we just stand our feet now? And uh, before we go into this time of worship, because I truly believe that we, we, we have these moments where we pray and make a commitment to God, the only response that we have is to worship and praise Him, okay? So I want to invite you, if you want to be prayed for, that you can, with, for help and strength to go all in for Jesus, then I want to invite you to come down the front. I want to invite you to come on down the front now. If you want to go all in for Jesus, if you want to open yourself up to God's Spirit to move in your life in a strong way, this is not the list that we're talking about, so there's no shame coming forward. What I'm saying is if you want to go all in for Jesus, you want to open up your life, no matter your age, young adult or young or old, come down the front. I'd love to pray over you. I invite you now to come. I believe there's so many people in this room that have so much potential to go all in for Jesus. So as we posture ourselves to receive what God has led on my heart to share with us this evening, why don't you stretch out your hands and receive from Him? Father, we thank you so much for showing us what our purpose is when we follow you. Father, we pray that in times like this, we can be so individualistic, so selfish. Father, we pray that our hearts our following of you will not be infected by the spirit of this world. We pray, Spirit of the living God, that we will follow you to find that which is lost, to find the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, the lost daughter. Father, forgive us if we've failed 
Forgive us if we've created our own version of Christianity so that we can live accordingly. Father, help us to recommit, to go all in, to sacrifice daily, every day, each and every day, to seek and save that which is lost. Lord Jesus, we are all in for you. Let's rise up a new generation, Lord, that isn't just easy and will quit when things get hard, Lord. Instead, we'll be passionate, we'll persevere, we'll strive towards you, Jesus. So come, Holy Spirit. Fill this room. Fill this space, Lord Jesus. Move, Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in and through and claim all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The team are just going to lead us in in, in some worship. There's this beautiful song that we're about to sing. is. It's called Open, where I give my whole life. I encourage you, if you've made that commitment, if you've been down here at the front tonight, man, worship God for all he has, because he deserves all glory, honor, and praise. Amen? Amen.
do praise you. We do thank you that you are our living hope, Lord. We just thank you for what you're doing in this space at the moment, Lord Jesus. That your Holy Spirit is moving, that your Holy Spirit is speaking to people, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We praise your mighty name. We thank you that it is because of you that we can walk in freedom, Lord. That we'll follow you wherever we go when we make that commitment to go all in. And it may be scary, um, and we may be afraid, Lord. But it's because of who you are that we can do it. It's because of what you've done that we can do that. And so we just open our hearts to want to follow you, Lord. Wherever that may take us, wherever we may go, lead us where you are. Tonight, I just, um, yeah, just really want to leave this space sort of open um, at the moment. Um, if you're feeling like you're you're finished and you're finished worshiping and praying and just seeking God, that's totally fine. Um, there's going to be some hot chocolates out there um, in the cafe and the the bake sales up. Um, is the bake sale still going? Um, but I really want to um, encourage you that if there is things that you want prayer for, there's going to be a bunch of leaders down here. Um, there's maybe people that you came with. Um, like, don't go, don't leave here. Um, with a burden on your heart or not being prayed for, I really um, feel real challenged <laughs> um, by just the things that Ruby um, really spoke about um, and just really get the sense that like this isn't a place of shame for those things. Um, I think often it can be really hard to come forward and to talk about these things that we struggle with, but we want this to be a place of freedom um, and that it is the Spirit of God that He is. It is in Him that we have freedom and so... Um, if that is you that is in those spaces, please come forward. Let us pray for you. Um, we would just love to do that. And maybe there is other things that it wasn't <laughs> those things on the list, but maybe there is something deep in your heart that you're really struggling with. Like, we would just love to pray for you. Um, find someone that you know, or if you don't know anyone, there'll be, uh, again, people up here. We would just love to pray for you. But um, if you really feel like this is um, your time uh, to head on out, that's totally fine as well. Um, maybe we can just, is it? can we do that open song a little bit here? Um, but yeah, feel free to leave if you want to. Um, but we just want to leave this space open for, for God to keep moving, for the Holy Spirit to do His work. Um, cool, let's do that.
Lord Jesus, thank you for being amongst us tonight. Thank you for the powerful testimonies of people like, like John Harper and just willing to go all in all the way to the very end and just seeking that what is lost right till the last moment. I pray that you'd give us a heart for the lost, Lord. I pray that this moment of surrender tonight would just be the start of a different, very, a very different way of living where when we get up each day, that's what we think about. Who do I know who doesn't know Jesus? Who can I share the love of Jesus with? Who can I invite into the life raft for? And I pray that our lives would be forever different. Thinking about that story of, of Daniel and Marcus, Lord, and, and what their life has gone on to, to be from that, that one small moment. May we have many moments like that, Lord. And thank you that your spirit goes ahead of us and prepares those moments. And so we don't have to step into any of them uh, with anxiousness or fear because we know that you are there leading us through conversations, guiding us in them, Lord. So we're grateful for that. But we lay it all down before you, Jesus. All down before you and say, we're all in. We're all in. Whatever that looks like. Wherever you want us to go, whatever you want us to do, we're all in, Jesus. We bring our time of, of worship in to a close. Again, if you want to stay in the space, you're more than welcome to. And, and you may even find that you want to gather with the people next to you and pray. Um, and just and pray with some close friends or some people that you've come with or that sort of thing. Again, if, if you're finished, you're welcome to head up to the cafe and uh, grab a hot chocolate and buy something from the bake sale. Um, but we're just going to leave this space like this. And so when you stay as long as you need, we'll pray for you if you need. We'll pray with the people around you. Get off if you need. Just do whatever you need to do from here. Just whatever the Lord's leading you to, just let him lead you in it. We'll be together again next Sunday. We'd love for you to be here with us. love for you to come and worship with us. We'll have lots of opportunities to gather through the week, like Tuesday night, the Kingdom Night. Come and be a part of that. The Kingdom Night, we sort of strip back all of the structure and we just pray and we sing and we worship and we are just together and the Spirit really moves. It's beautiful. So if you want more of this, come and join us on Tuesday night. Or come and be a part of the other ways we gather together through our connect groups and things like that. So just stay in the space as long as you as you need. I pray that this moment is a real stake in the ground for those of you who are saying that you're ready to surrender and that uh, tomorrow would be different, that when you wake up, it would be different and you'd just be ready to be looking for the lost and going all in. But thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for worshiping with us. It's been so good to be together and, and just recognize what Jesus has done in our lives and be challenged to go and share that with others. So have a great week and we'll see you next time.